<laughs> well, good morning. We have a great one here for you today, all about interviewing. You know, interviewing is a really unique opportunity to change the equation substantially, but you have to be really ready for your presentation. And so today we'll talk you through all the different ways of upping your game significantly in the interview process because uh, it's the game changer. It is where you can persuade them that you are really the one. You know, my take on interviewing is that it's your job to walk in the door or walk into that Zoom meeting or whatever it might be, and to teach them how to select you. Now, this is the third uh, session this week. If you missed the other sessions, you can easily see them on any of the platforms that you're watching me on. In case you're joining me on LinkedIn or over on Facebook or my self-recruiter YouTube channel, probably the easiest one to see the replays, just click the live tab. Uh, you can see we talked about resume renovation on Tuesday, all the ways to ch really change things uh, it, you know, for your resume, how to make it a standout document that really captures the essence and value of your career on a single sheet of paper. Yesterday, we talked about how to take your career brand and really transform that into a three-dimensional sales brochure with how you construct your LinkedIn profile. Uh, so hopefully, if you didn't see those, go back and watch them. Today, we're going to jump into interview intervention. You know, interviewing is about the, the influence and the nuance that's possible in communications. Uh, many of us are, oh, not as engaging, not as warm, and not as uh, great on the soft skills as we should be. But that's something that we can change. That's something we can practice in advance. If your job was to go in a competitor company or potential company, a B2B company that you're about to sell your product or service to, you wouldn't hesitate to put together a full plan of, how am I going to win this presentation? You just wouldn't go in there and hope they pick you. Your job is to really change things. Now, part of our personal branding uh, comes across the resume, comes across the LinkedIn profile, but it also comes right into the interview with how you decide to show up, how you present yourself, how you speak about yourself, all of those things that separate you as a product from somebody else. You have very tough competitors that want this role as well, but you have to think about the things that separate you from those other individuals and which ones you're going to highlight. Now, a trap we fall into in interviewing is we tend to want to tell it the same way we've always told it. Oh, this is the way I always told the story. Okay. And maybe it worked for you in the past, but really you have to take in consideration what your audience needs to hear and construct only those pieces that they need to hear to close the deal. So make sure your personal branding is up to date, whether that's your resume, LinkedIn, cover letter, all the messaging that you use, all the outreach, uh, even your email signature block, all of those things can help you quite a bit. Now, in interviewing, uh, our success is determined almost completely by preparation because it's a sales process. Well, actually, it's two things we don't like. It's a sales process and it's a dating process, <laughs> both things that are really tough. So if it's a sales process, we have to make our case. We have to get in there and persuade them. We have to not just show them what we have to offer, but we have to make the case that we're the very, very best one. Can't let it become an interrogation or a cross-examination or any of those things because it's our job to teach them how to select us as the very best individual. And that means you have to drink enough of the Kool-Aid yourself to really believe you are the best individual for this role and why you're better than the next five or six people that want that job. Now, one of the traps I've talked about this all week in each session is, you know, we quickly conclude whether it's resume, LinkedIn, getting ready for my interview. I'll just be, I'll be cookie cutter perfect, cookie, cookie cutter perfect. Fantastic, fantastic. Really, really? Okay, I'll take number two, number two. I'm going to take you. I'm going I'm to pay you less. Oh, you don't want less? Okay, number five, number three, doesn't really matter. You're all cookie cutter perfect. You begin to see the problem with only being cookie cutter perfect. Yes, you need to be the cookie cutter perfect, but you also need to be somehow different, exceptional, and really allow yourself to step out of line and be different. That's how you get a carve out for different responsibility or a different compensation package, all those things that we're really after. If you haven't seen me before, John Krant, author, career coach, and speaker, resume and LinkedIn guru as well. So if you're uh, suffering as most individuals are from very poor storytelling across your very important marketing materials, that's your resume and your LinkedIn profile, uh, reach out to me. You can check out my self-recruiter website. You can click under the services tab. All my packages are there. And of course, if we need to talk before you know which one is right for you, send me a quick email at john at selfrecruiter.com and I'll set up a time to talk and we'll 
talk about all those different things that'll help you. Now, my book is also a good resource. Easiest place to pick up my book is over on Amazon. You can check that out. I'm a big fan, as you can tell by the subtitle, of changing the rules. That rule works for me. Oh, I love that rule. Love, great rule, great rule. That rule doesn't work for John. <laughs> That's meant for somebody else. I need to step over that fence or barrier or whatever little thing has been set up to keep the other people away because that's certainly not intended for me. This will act as a great roadmap to a lot of the challenges you may have. Now, on my self-recruiter website, there's a special version of yesterday's LinkedIn lecture, one where you can see me large or the slides large. Really, you can use that as a start and stop tutorial if you're going to tackle uh, building a new LinkedIn profile yourself. The challenge in a new resume or new LinkedIn profile, if we're trying to do it ourselves, is that we're so emotionally close to the story, we can't see it any differently than, than we've already experienced it. And we don't have the perspective that someone outside has to set the stage, set the lighting, and really create the narrative that's still lettered true. Now, my LinkedIn profile, a couple of the resources, then we'll get right into today's content. You can check out my articles, and they'll help you through a number of the challenges you may be facing. So the whole lecture series, including these three this week, I have about nine or 10 different lectures. The three this week are all about becoming a self recruiter. How is it I become this one great recruiter that looks after one great candidate, but you also have to be this person that holds the conversation. You have to be road mapping everything in your head at the same time, a strategist. To, uh, when we get beaten down, we have to pick ourselves up by the bootstrap straps and, and dust ourselves off. We have to be all of those people. Um, so we, it's about taking back control, being able to think on multiple levels at the same time, and also keeping one eye on the toughest competitor imaginable, <laughs> those four, five, six people that would just take that job from you. By the way, those perfect people, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure if I've really met one. You know, we'd all like to be perfect, but you know what we are? We're human beings and we're defective by definition. We're all unique. We're all interesting and different. So those, per those perfect people suffer from something called ego and arrogance, and they don't actually prepare, or very few of them actually prepare. They get themselves all dressed up and everything else. Well, you know, we all have to do that. That's not preparing. With a little bit of strategy, a little bit of planning, you can outmaneuver them very, very quickly, uh, even though they're shiny and sparkly and all those things. You know, we'd all love to see the job, go after the job, get the job, maybe get the interview. That's always very, very nice. And then they just award us the prize if it only worked that way. But it's really not that simple. Everybody's sitting back doing the same thing you're doing. They're hitting that darn button. Uh, kindly says apply here, but almost always says submit all capital letters until we're so submissive. It's like a Friday night waiting for that phone call to ring. It's going to ring. It's going to ring. Telemarketer when it does or scammer these days, these days, all of this process of really lack of control, whether it's lack of control of the story on the resume or lack of understanding how to create a sales brochure for yourself on LinkedIn, or really lack of understanding how to put together a proper preparation for a full interview. I'll just go in and answer questions. What? <laughs> Let's not. Yes. Use the device of, of Q and a to position and sell myself, but I'm not there to answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> at least not necessarily their questions. All of that leaves us in this very unhappy place because we just didn't do the work. We're stuck in this cycle of the, the, the usual customer expected when we should be in the unusual, unconventional, unexpected area, which really opens up different doorways. It changes that equation of diminishing returns simply by changing the rules. Rules I'd say you never agreed to in the first place. So let's get back to this idea of us as a product. As we get ready for interview, we have to think about how how should this product be lit? How should it be positioned? What should I say about this product? What, what, what will, will, can I say that will make them jump out of their chair and realize I'm the one? Well, let's look at our competitors first. I like, I like this slide. I'd like to read it. It's one of my favorite slides of my entire series. This is about half of the workforce. I really hate to say it pains me, pains me. Uh, mediocre of only moderate quality, not very good, ordinary, average, middling, middle of the road, uninspired, undistinguished, indifferent, unexceptional, unexciting, unremarkable, <laughs> run of the mill, pedestrian, lackluster, uh, forgettable, amateur, okay, so, so, come see, come saw, plain vanilla, fair to middling, no great shakes, not up to much, and bush league. Not very nice. But you know, if you understand half the workforce is mediocre, what do you have to be? Just a little bit better than mediocre to be ahead of most of them. 
And all you have to do is put a little bit of your heart and soul into whatever you do. And suddenly you're the top one, two, three percent almost by default. So the effort is worth it. Now let's get to your story. Your interview is about getting your story ready, whether that's in person, over the phone, or uh, video today through whatever platform we're using. We're there to not just tell the story, but we're there to persuade them, hopefully putting them in our shoes, looking out of our eyes, experiencing what we're trying to sell them. And that means you have to prepare your story in advance. So don't answer questions. What? 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 <laughs> well, yes, we're going to use the device of a Q&A to answer certain questions the way I'd like to and position and sell. Uh, but let's take this idea of don't answer questions. What if you're what if you're asked a question that you don't want to answer or is not the right question? Gosh, I wish they asked me the right question. Uh, tough time to talk, talk about politics, but let's talk about a good politician. I don't know if there is one, <laughs> but if there was a good politician or someone that acts uh, in a good way using the political uh, possibilities that are there, when they get asked a question that's that's inappropriate or not the right one, what they do is they quickly rephrase. Now, if you'd like to see this in action in a good way, uh, Tim Cook, who's running Apple right now, a um, few springs ago, he was talking to a college audience. No, it wasn't a commencement, but you can look. He's, it's, I'm sure it's on YouTube. He's Everyone had their iPhones up recording. So he's talking to a college audience and uh, someone asks him, uh, when is it okay not to listen to our professors? I see standing right next to the professor. Oh, thank you so much for that. Very inappropriate question. And what he said was, uh, I, th I think what you mean to say is, when is it okay not to follow the rules? And I think, I think you should rarely <laughs> follow the rules. I think you should be writing the rules if you'd like to get to where you'd like to dream about. And, you know, that's a really great point. You have to be able to recast and, and go a different direction that, works for you. You're there to persuade them, ready to share uh, the knowledge, ready to open up a pathway to them selecting you as the very, very best one. That begins with our own understanding of why are we valuable in the first place? Why am I more valuable than these next five or six people that desperately also want this job? Um, secret that you may not like. It's There's only two reasons you get hired. Here they are. Here they are assuming you're capable and, and competent for the role. I wouldn't hire anybody that wasn't capable and competent for the role, but that's not why I hire you. <laughs> um, you know, the, the number one reason you get hired above all other things is chemistry. Number two reason you get hired above all other things other than chemistry is confidence. And that's before the credentialing, the background, the work product, everything else, assuming you're right for the role in the first place. So how many of us really put in the effort to understand how to build chemistry, how to uh, convey confidence. Most of us lack a lot of confidence during the interview process because we allow it to become an interrogation versus a conversation. You have to create engagement, but it's it's much closer to this style of engagement than the mechanical style of engagement in the discussion. So back to this idea of our story and how we make it engaging, how we set the stage and the lighting and, and everything else you know, yes, be capable and qualified, but it's really about how are you interesting? What makes you tick? What drives you? What are your passions? Um, and I don't mean to go off on some tangent about whatever it is you love to do on your free time. Although, yes, a little bit of that mixed in because they have to relate to you. By the way, why do we why do we why are we interested in these other things that aren't the capable and qualified? Because if I hire you, I'm likely to spend my my waking life with you. I'm probably going to spend more time with you than I spend with my loved ones. That's why we want to like you. So you have to have enough pieces of that story also that they understand you're not a three-headed monster. If they get trapped in the airport for four hours with you, they're not going to want to end their life. Very, very important stuff. Used to have managers in the hiring process as a headhunter many years ago that would have that airport test. Like, John, if I get stuck in the airport four hours, am I going to want to kill myself? I'm like... You'll like this one. <laughs> paradigm shift to everything. Paradigm shift today is all about how we prepare for interview and how we really gently take control during the interview process so that uh, it's a sales meeting. Would you let someone else run your sales meeting? Of course you wouldn't. I don't mean to be the bull in the china shop taking control, but I mean to gently guide them toward where you need to. Now, in 
putting together all of our story. Hopefully you you were tuning in on Tuesday for Resume Renovation, where we went through the deep dive interview coming up with the, the nine different pages of background all about you. There's a lot of the story elements that you need to think about right there. Let me grab a little tissue. Sorry about that. Um, but the magic to this whole process is filtering all that through this singular question. Why is it going to be the very best business decision they make today if they choose to hire you? And then getting those stories ready to present and talk about. Um, commenting in even when they ask you a question. Well, John, tell me about this background. <laughs> you know, that's so interesting. You know why it's so interesting? Because I just set it. <laughs> I set this stage. I'm leading them in. You know, when the CEO had uh, had called me, I picked up the phone and heard their voice right into my shoes, looking out of my eyes as I tell the story. You have to convert your stories over to reality. So think about what happened in that moment and retell it in a different way. And by the way, as you get your stories ready to tell, you need to write them out. Very few people can be great off the cuff. Uh, when you write them out, one of the traps is we tend to write like it's for our English teacher. I don't want you to murder the language. Don't mishear that. But we don't speak the way we write. If you write the great story out and then try to verbalize it, you're going to sound like a canned ham. You have to write organically in the way that you speak, and then you have to practice it to get muscle memory so that you're relaxed, like you're telling that story to a dear old friend, even though you're just meeting this person for the first time. This is part of the communication mastery, the soft skills that we have to think about. This is our intelligence, emotional intelligence quotient uh, of how we interact with other people. And that's a lot of different things, not just the verbal pieces. So think of everything that you see here on this list and how are you going to up your game. Now, I hear a lot of people tell me, oh, you know, but I'm, I'm so introverted. I'm so shy. I'm... <laughs> okay, I'll let you in on a little secret today, which you heard in my sessions earlier this week. No matter what you see here, <laughs> I'm actually very, very shy and introverted, which usually makes my friends spit out their drink when they hear it because they're like, oh. <laughs> never seen it, John. I get it. I get it. I've become very, very good with technique at hiding those things. But you know what? That Shyness and introversion is just under the surface. I'm also very, very driven and competitive. Those are <laughs> those things can exist together. I still want to win, even though I'm a little wallflower. I'm willing to do what's necessary. So you, it takes practice. It takes preparation. It takes optimism, belief in yourself, and drinking enough of the Kool-Aid that you truly do believe you're better than the next five or six individuals because your job is to persuade them to that point. All of this is about influence. You know, we do make a lot of our decisions based on credentialing and background and all those things, but really in almost every hiring case, it comes down to gut feeling. How do I feel about this person? How do I feel about that person? Oh, I have a good feeling over here. I'm not even sure why, but I have a good feeling. Chemistry and confidence along with the right background. Who are you going to roll the dice on? Because every time it's a roll of the dice. There's lots of people that have the right background, the right credentialing, and then they can't get themselves out of a paper bag in the role. It's like, was it all bluster? <laughs> apparently it was, apparently it was. Uh, you know, and there's other people who are soft-spoken and go, well, there's, they'll just hire me because I'm, I'm the right one and look at all I've produced. You know, you need to stand up and almost literally say, this is why you need to hire me. And this is what I'll do for you. And here's why I'll be the best person for the role because they're looking to be convinced. They're looking for you to teach them how to select you. Now, in part of this process, we're gonna teach you how to build a whole preparation plan, but it, you have to warm up your interview audience. So part of that means going to LinkedIn, like I taught yesterday in the Building Your Career Brand with LinkedIn lecture. We're gonna reverse search the company. That's the last five minutes of yesterday's video. You can watch that for you. Reverse search the company. I'm going to open up certainly all of the people's names they gave me. If they gave me five different people's names, I'm opening up each of those five people. But I'm probably going to open up a few other people around those people just to make sure my audience is quite warm and they're looking at me ahead of the interview because they could be walking me down the hall and introduce me to one of those folks. And I want them to have a little bit of awareness of me. But the people I'm going to meet for sure, I'm going to open. I'm going to ask them to connect. It's a sales process, so we have to think about that. And I'm going to give them a little gentle reminder that you're about to meet me. I'm professionally appropriate. And here's a little stroke to the ego. 
Maybe it's as simple as uh, looking forward to our 10 a.m. interview on Friday. And of course, I'd love to add you to my professional network on LinkedIn. I'm appropriate, reminds them gently. Well, here's some language you can think about right there and take a screenshot. So the point of this process of opening them and giving them the gentle reminder and connecting with them before the interview, don't be offended. They might not accept the connection until after the interview. The connection itself is not the point. The point is to get them to click on your name, to get them to your three-dimensional sales brochure all about you, to get them to read about their background, your background. They have no credibility issue with themselves. Um, this is kind of a flaw in how human beings are. When they read something themselves, they tend to believe it. Now, don't mishear that and don't misrepresent on your LinkedIn profile, but if you can get them to read about yourself in advance with the right resume, with the right LinkedIn profile that positions and sells, it's a lot less work that you have to do in discussion to establish that. All of these are gentle little figurative nudges to move your brand forward before you even walk in the door. Small changes change perception. Be persuasive. Let's get to the interview plan itself and let me get a little bit of coffee. It is my second one of the day, but I love coffee during my lectures. So we're going to come down and drill down to each one of these. So let me just run down this list real quick, and then we're going to move on and drill down. An interview plan is like a sales plan. Would you go into a meeting at, at, at some company to sell your product or service without a sales plan? I don't think you'd make very many sales. So we have to build our agenda. What do we intend to convey? What do we think they need to hear? How am I going to position and sell that? How am I going to create engagement? Uh, I think we have to do a needs analysis. I think we have to We're going to come back to each one of these. <laughs> we have to select and customize our work life stories. I can't tell all the stories, but I have to have them all ready so I can pick and choose. Oh, I think they need to hear this story. No, no, they need to hear that story because that will help close the deal in their mind. If there's no buy sign, I've got to ask them what's missing. I can't just let this come to a close and leave that rattling around in their brain without dealing with it. I have to overcome any of the objections, whether they're stated objections or ones I suspect they're thinking about. I can't leave those rattling up there. I have to close them. I have to make them sh sure that I'm the best selection. I have to either get the job offer or I have to get the, the, the next interview. And I have to get it now. I can't, I can't accept that, you know, gosh, great to meet you. You know, we have a few more people to see. You have a few more people to see after me. <laughs> really, I, I'm ready to start on Monday. Could I pull that off? Probably, probably. Can everybody? Not necessarily. But you need to believe in yourself. Let's drill down here. Let's talk about building an agenda. Who am I going to meet? So when I'm prepping clients, you know, I'll do interview preps with clients and and, they'll, and I'll say, well, who are you going to meet? Well, they sent me, I'm going to meet uh, Jack and Jill. Is that all of the people you're going to meet? Well, yeah, I think so. so mm, doesn't sound like you know for sure. Email them back. Well, I just emailed them this morning. Email them again. It's worth it. <laughs> Looking forward to the meeting with Jack and Jill. In addition uh, to, to those individuals, can you let me know who else I'm likely, there's a very important word, likely to meet with so I can fully prepare for the meeting? If you forget the word likely, they're going to go, oh, I'm not really sure. And then you trapped yourself. You didn't get very far. Likely, they're going to go, oh, I'm not really sure, but probably maybe uh, two or three of your peers also. Okay, I'm meeting Jack and Jill and two or three of my peers. Well, I can do the reverse search of LinkedIn like I taught yesterday, last five minutes of that video. And I can look for who my peers would be. I understand the organizational structure. I look for who my peers would be. Oh, there's six peers. I'm going to meet two or three of them. I have to plan on how to build chemistry with all six because I don't know which three, two or three I'm going to meet along with Jack and Jill. How am I going to build chemistry with each one of those? Because they, based on their background experience and, and where they work, they may need different approaches. And I have to think about that in advance. Very few people can just do it on the fly. What career stories do I need to talk about with which audience that I'm going to meet with? Am I going to meet as a roundtable discussion or is this one-on-one -on -one, back to back to back? You know, there's some companies that will line you up for an eight hour process where you meet 20 people because by the end of the day, you're just so beaten down. They know exactly who you are. You can't stay hiding that long. <laughs> there's a purpose to those, those setups. What will make them jump out of their chair? What can I uh, expect they need to hear? What else can I leave them thinking? All these things are very, very important. 
do a needs analysis. What's that? What's that? I don't know. What's a needs analysis is just a scary sales term really boils down to before you answer any questions, reconfirm what you believe the need to be. Don't go by that thing called a job posting. <laughs> you know what I call the job posting? I have a very different phrase for it. I call it the list of the irrelevance. That's a new word with a TNS because almost everything on that list is irrelevant. Yes, yes, yes. Tangentially connected. I get it. I get it. That's not a picture of the day-to-day -day of this job. And yet somehow that's like chiseled in stone as a, as a laundry list. That's not really it. So that could be a loose side of the barn of, of what they're looking for, but I need to get to the bullseye. So I can't have them think I didn't do my homework. So even if they get the first question in before I can do the needs analysis, Oh, John, tell me about yourself. Magic is to start over and go, oh, I'd love to tell you about myself before I do. I'd love to hear and then stroke their ego. I'd love to hear from your perspective or your view or your analysis as, as I step into this role, notice how I'm visually projecting myself into the role so they can imagine it. As I step into this role from your perspective, what are the two or three things that I really need to get control of in the first 30 to 60 days? Stay away from 90 days. That triggers something very, very different. 30 to 60 days will get them to think about what's on fire, what's just derailed, what's about to derail. And most of those things are not listed in that darn job posting. So having those items would really help me quickly understand which story do I grab and talk to them about that will show that I'm really a compelling match. This is part of the needs analysis. Other, if you're having difficulty extracting this information, you can ask them different in different ways. What are, what are the pain points? What would you like to see change? What would you like to solve? Why is, why is this position open? Oh, I don't think it's appropriate. I talk about that. Well, that tells me enough right there. I used to say those exact words all the time to a hiring manager when I was getting more detail. That tells me the person was fired. It's really clear. So then I simply, after that, I simply go, well, then what would you like? to be different? What would you like to see changed? And they're going to tell me exactly why that person was fired. And if I can solve those issues, I'm going to give an example and step right in and get that checkbox. What have they not seen? Probably the most important question that you could ask, save it to last. You know, Jack, Jim, Jill, let me, let me ask you, what have you not seen? Or what have we not discussed that would help you in your selection process? And they'll tell you what the, the reason they haven't hired so far, the reason why they didn't choose any of the other candidates. Select and customize your work life stories. They're not all right for each individual, but all right for every audience. So be prepared with different aspects and different ideas. What illustrates a skill or a value or uh, the greatest interest to the individual? What, you know, what satisfies them and, and will help them select you? It's their job to overcome objections. It's their job to object to you. When someone objects to some part of my background, I'm like, <laughs> yes, what? Yes, yes, because they wouldn't pose that objection if they didn't want to hear how I would put my thoughts together. Uh, you haven't worked in our industry. You haven't worked in this role. You haven't worked since last year. You know all the things they can accuse you of. So it's your job to craft something to overcome that. I like to use an agree but disagree technique. You've never worked in our industry. You know, I haven't just like it's a gift from up above. I can't pretend I've worked in this industry or make pretend it doesn't matter. I have to hit it full force, agree with them. You know, I, I haven't, but I'm sure, and here's where I begin to throw the competitor under the bus, but I'm sure I meet a lot of those candidates. Everybody else is a candidate. I, da, 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 da. I'm always an individual. I'm sure I meet a lot of those candidates and the other folks that you speak with. What I bring to the table and then present your solution, your agree but disagree. And I'm going to disagree and tell them why I'm so valuable. What I bring to this role is something very, very different. It's also why, because it's my job to persuade them. It's also why I'll be the very best one for this role and help your team reach a new level. So whatever it is, I'm sure that you can come up with a good way to overcome those objections, but it takes crafting it out in advance and practicing it. Practice, practice, practice until we are blue in the face. No buy sign. We like to kid ourselves about buy signs. There's only two buy signs in the interview process. One is, hey, I'd like to bring you back next week to meet Jack or Jill or whoever else you haven't met. Fantastic indication of the next interview. They don't actually have to schedule it. They already said they're bringing me back. Perfect. I already want it. Uh, yes, I'd like them to schedule it, but I've won it. 
So I got the buy sign. The only other buy sign is, gosh, we'd, we'd like to move toward offer. Uh, <laughs> fantastic. I love it. Let's close the deal. Uh, anything that sounds like this, like, oh my gosh, John, what a great discussion. You have a terrific background. I could really see you in this role. <gasps> really? <laughs> uh, but we have a few more people to see, uh, probably about two or three more weeks before we really have a decision. Segways over to the the horse whipping its tail to get rid of the flies very, very quickly. Um, if there's no buy sign, I need to overcome that objection. I can't let them sit and think about whatever they think is wrong with me. Why didn't they choose me? If I was the best one, they should have like just said, stop the presses. Let's hire this person now. So we're going to use closing questions at this point, if we don't get the buy sign to help them visualize their process, their hiring process, almost like a two-dimensional timeline, a race in our office as recruiters years ago. We had the horse race board. That's what we called it. And we had little horses <laughs> that would we, we'd move across toward the finish line. It was good sales motivation. Probably really not a nice way to talk about your candidates, but uh, it was the horse race board. It was very motivating from a sales perspective. Let's solve those problems and get them to the finish line. Um, closing questions will, will help them visualize this and help see in their mind where you are in relation to the finish line. We'll also help them think about what's wrong with you. <gasps> Yes, I want them to think about what's wrong with me right now so we can talk about it and I can overcome it. Probably with agree but disagree technique. Well, Jack, what have you not heard or what have we not discussed? A little positive, negative, because we don't know how their brain is wired. That would help you in your decision process for this role. Now, that, that's pretty good. Uh, is it enough for John? <laughs> probably not. I'd like it to amp it up a little bit more. So for myself, I'd probably go, well, well Jack, what have you not heard or what have we not discussed that would help you in your selection of me? as the very best individual for this role. And then I have to not blink as I'm looking at them or bite my cheek or whatever I need to do as long as possible. Um, and they might go, well, well John, I, I think you're probably a little weak in area A. Oops. Am I weak in area A? I am, I am, I am, I'm weak in area A. Ooh, is area A important? Uh, yes. <laughs> Did you talk about area A? Um, I avoided talking about area A because I've only worked on two projects and I was scared. Well, that's not a very good way to instill confidence about area A, is it, that you said was important? So I can overcome that by simply, well, I didn't put it on screen, so let me just give it to you. <laughs> I can overcome that by by simply saying, well, you know, that's that's very interesting, uh, Jack. Um, you know, in area A, I really have that background. In fact, I've worked on projects such as this and such as that. I didn't say it was the only two projects, letter true what I'm saying, even though these are the only true. Which would you like to discuss? My job is to quell their concerns, make them go away, make them evaporate, help them realize I'm really perfect for the role, for the team, for everything else. So think about all these things to create an actual interview plan. We have to create the agenda ourselves. We have to follow and execute that agenda. We have to do the needs analysis before we answer too many questions or really any questions from my view. We have to tell just the right work-life stories to just the right audience. Uh, we have to figure out what's missing. If there's no buy sign, we have to overcome those objections and we have to close them about ourselves being the very best selection for the role. You're there to persuade. Now, let me take you through interview prep in a slightly different way. This is the self-recruiter interview checklist. It's going to cover many of the things we already really talked about, but help us think in a slightly different uh, bent here. So, we have to complete the research. Research is very, very important. That means researching the job, what's going on with the competitors. Uh, what do I think the job should be? Because if you think you're qualified, you should write the job description yourself. <laughs> Why not? Um, let me do all the research about the company. It's like read read every word of the website. Every word of the website? That's, 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 do you want this job or not want this job? Read every word of the website. And I hope while you're there, you learn to copy and paste some of their really great phrases and language about how they speak about themselves so that you can begin to integrate that into your style so they can hear their own employees speaking to them. He seems like he'd fit right in. Yes, I do. <laughs> Company culture, we're going to have to figure that out along the way. You may not even figure that one out until you're actually working there. It's a tough one. Do the needs analysis early in the meeting. We talked about that. Oh, behave. Watch your body language. Um, they have to take a phone call in the middle of their interview. This happened to me one time. I was interviewing to become a recruiter. And I went into this one firm and I opened the door. This will tell you how long ago it was. 
I open the door to the office and out rolls a cloud of cigarette smoke. I'm like, holy Christmas, I am never working here. I could have just turned around and walked away right then. But why? I have a golden ticket, a free chance to try every single interview technique I have because I'm never going to work here. And in the middle of our interview, this guy was, he was running the office and he was trying desperately to try to corner me about closing. Does John understand closing? And honestly, I had a very loose understanding of closing. I thought it just meant asking for what you'd like, but I knew that wasn't quite the right answer. Part of the answer, part of the answer. And, and so I was very slippery in conversation and he couldn't pin me down, which also points to his lack of ability. But in the middle of the interview, he gets this call and he throws his feet up on the desk, barking on the phone. Yeah, it doesn't look really great for you, <laughs> the interviewer, but this is their work environment. So just because he got all casual and everything else doesn't mean I can slouch and just wait and I have to stay on point listening. I'm like, would you like me to step out? <laughs> He's like, mm, I just stay there, stay there. Watch your body language. The other thing with body language is, well, two things. One is eyeballing. I know you desperately want this job. But you can't be like one of those statues that no matter where we move in the room, the eyes never move. It's like, oh, my gosh, security. <laughs> we have to look away and think for a second, even if we don't need to. And we have to come back and give them a little love. And we have to look away for a second. We have to come back, watch the eye contact. Yes, good eye contact, but don't eyeball them. That's a little freaky. Uh, the other thing is the sweaty hands. It's very normal to be sweaty. Uh, I used to go out to bring people back to interview as a recruiter. And I'd go out into the lobby, I'd shake their hands. And in my brain, I'm going, ooh, it's like soaking wet. I get it. I get it. You know, I was, I was invited to uh, Book Expo America a few years back at the Javits Center here in New York City. And I was on a roundtable discussion with three very top publishers and John. And I'm going, how did I get here? <laughs> I have a whole book series in my head and I want to pitch these three people. And I had some people I knew in the audience that came to see me. And I had my computer, my book, everything spread out, and my coffee, and my hands resting on the table so I wouldn't shake. <laughs> and then I moved my hand to grab my coffee, and there's this giant sweaty ghost print on the table. I was horrified, going, oh, I hope they don't see it. My target people to the left, I hope they don't see it and realize I'm scared <laughs> and nervous. Um, you know, when we're in the interview process, that's normal. Just none of this stuff. Nobody wants to shake your hand after you've done that. Uh, and uh, you just keep your hands loose, free, lightly on your legs, just lightly, you know, so it stays airy. And then hopefully they'll be dry when you go to shake a hand. Very, very important. Just watch your body language. Keep it professional at all times. Dress like you are a success. You know, I was out doing cardio earlier this morning, and I'm in running tights and, and five-finger shoes and everything else. And if I showed up here like this, like that, I don't think you'd be taking my advice. You have to be the embodiment of, of what you're expected. I don't care if in your work life you, you can wear more casual clothes. This is your chance to look like a million bucks. Your competitor walks in looking better than you. They're ahead of you, and you can't let that happen. If someone goes, oh, oh, you didn't have to dress. Oh, you know, I have a meeting this afternoon. Likely with your competitor. <laughs> Leave that part out, but that's, of course, what we want them to think about. Giving you so much to think about, you're going to forget to listen. Your job in the interview process is to have all of this processing, thinking, roadmapping going on at the same time and a super duper listener at the same time that helps you form questions, help you form challenges, things that will help you in your process. You're there to sell yourself. I know you're there to evaluate whether it's right for you. Absolutely, absolutely. But you can't ever let them see you evaluating whether it's right for you. You're there to sell yourself all in or you may not get that offer. Get the offers, and if it's not right for you, you can professionally turn it down. Would you like more money? <laughs> I know John would like more money. There's nothing wrong with that. We'd all like more money. The best way to get more money is don't talk about money. It's really that simple. Now, my clients will go, but, but when, 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 when? Don't talk about money. But when, 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 when? The goal in a perfect world is to get entirely to the end of the interview process having never having money come up in the first place. I certainly will not have filled out one of those online things and disclosed financials. None of that. The longer you wait until they think of you and a number, the easier it gets. Later in the process, after you've had a lot of time to sell yourself to them, 
they'll think of a different number, which is a different starting place. And it makes it much, much easier. Get the offer, good, bad, or ugly. Doesn't matter. Title, right title, wrong title, doesn't matter. Get the offer. Then you negotiate that. That's like we don't negotiate the diamond until the ring is on the finger. Now the ring is on the finger. I don't know why you thought I was an oval. We're going back to the store. <laughs> you get the idea. Sorry for those folks that have an oval. Um, timing to get it right. Well, there's two things to think about on timing. First off, if it's a physical interview, get to the interview in advance or at least the space. Get there to the local coffee shop or the park bench or whatever's right for you. Go over your notes. Think about everything that you need to do. Pull yourself together. Be centered. Make sure you have the right amount of caffeine, the right amount of, uh, of calories, everything else so you don't crash during the interview. Then close your notebook about 10 minutes ahead of time so you can just be centered. Trust that all this homework will be available for you. Then give yourself enough time to get through the building security and the lobby security and arrive at their lobby reception area on whatever floor they are about five to 15 minutes before the interview, not one moment earlier. You arrive at 1035 for an 11 o'clock and, and, and I get the call, your, your 11 o'clock is here. Oh, my day's already out of control. Now I gotta, I can't leave you sitting out there 25 minutes. And I have to put on happy face and I have to come out and go, oh, so great to see you. You know what, I'll be out probably right at 11 or could even be just a minute or two after. And say, oh, you're messing up my day already. Think about your timing, very, very important. You need to show that you relieve pressure, not or a burden to the, to the whole system. Other timing issues, when you get the offer, if you're going to negotiate that, absolutely, you should sit on an overnight over the weekend, whatever it might be, if you're going to negotiate it. If you're not going to negotiate it and you're going to accept the offer, you need to accept it now. Do not kill the momentum. Give them the win. There's no purpose to taking away the win if you're going to accept it anyway. So think about timing. Very, very, very important. Whole time in discussion, next step, opportunity, opportunity, and don't forget to ask for the job. That's not like, hey, I want this job. Well, it could be, it could be. Uh, but most times it's simply, I'm really excited about what we talked about. What's our next step? Well, John, we're about to walk down the hall and meet Sally. I thought that was on the agenda. Yes, yes, it was, it was. But this, every single person needs to hear, I'm excited. Because they have a round table discussion after all the interviews are done going, oh, here's all the resumes. What do we think of these people? And they remember the one going, oh, I'm excited. I want this job, not just a job. I want this job. The real homework, of course, is preparing the answers to the questions you might be asked. You're the expert in your background. Imagine that you're the manager having to hire. What questions would you ask? Write those down and craft amazing, amazing answers. To those, you're going to add three self-recruiter questions. First one is, tell me why I should hire you over all others that I see. Not likely to ask you this question. They might, they might. But elements of this answer have to be factored into your answers or you're not going to really win. The next one is tell me why my work life will get easier or better if I hire you. Now, again, probably not likely to ask you it this way, but elements of this answer have to be factored in or they're not likely to choose you. Last one you really already know, which is tell me why it's the best business decision I'll make today if I choose to hire you. Again, not likely to ask it this way, but you better have those elements mixed in. And practice makes perfect. Play role play with a coach or a friend. I know a good coach that can role play these things with you. And practice, practice, practice until you have it organically. How about some thank you notes? How about some follow up? You know, when I give these in person talks at the library and the Department of Labor and other places, uh, I'd go, "Well, how many people send a thank you note?" And the majority of the audience would throw up their hands. I'm like, "Liar, liar, pants on fire." <laughs> I've been in the interview process, and unfortunately. Very few people send the thank you notes. It's like, really? All you have to do to be a standout is send a thank you note. But thank you notes can also solve your problems in advance. And that means rather than just, well, please, let me just say this. Please don't thank anybody for their time ever again. You cannot be an equal by thanking someone for their time. Thank them for the great insights, the great discussion or something meaningful, but not their time. You cannot be subservient to them. You have to be equal. So rather than going home after the interview, go to the park bench, go to the coffee shop, whatever it might be. Do a dump of all the things that are floating around in your brain, no matter how tangential. There's a reason you're thinking about it. Capture it now before it's lost. This is where you do this debrief, this interrogation, this cross-examination, this grilling. What did I do well? What didn't go so well? Where did I stick my foot in my mouth? What, what opportunities did I miss? You need to repeat the good stuff and learn from the bad stuff. 
And and what did I avoid talking about? <gasps> area A. Ooh, that area A. <laughs> Most important question to ask yourself is the last one. It's a little demoralizing. And that is if they don't move forward with me or if they don't extend me an offer, what's the reason going to be? And this is not one you think about. This is more like hit the funny bone and it reacts, regurgitate whatever you think the answer is. And your gut feeling after a little bit of training this way, your gut feeling is right almost every time. Oh, because I'm weak in area A. This saved one of my promotions early in my career. <laughs> Went in, I didn't understand recruiting yet. It was before that when I was working in corporate. Uh, I had the number one department out of 121 departments, number one PL in the country. And my retail location uh, that I worked in, my department, was the number four store in the entire country. And my gosh, you know, this guy goes up to be country manager of Canada. I already have the number one PL for my department. I go, oh, well, John should just rise to the throne. And I went in, I had a great interview, but it was two regional managers making the decision. My regional manager who really got me and the other regional manager who, I don't get John. I don't get John. Well, you get John's PL. <laughs> it's pretty darn good. Um, and so I go back to my, my place and I call my, my spy in headquarters. Good to have a spy in headquarters. Oh, I think it went well. I think, no, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. You're, they're in there now arguing about something about your vision for the store. I'm like, oh, how did I forget to convey my vision for the store? Well, I fell in the ego and arrogance trap. I could actually see my competitors at the lesser stores. And because I already brought a lot of business skill prior to this role to the table, I'm like, <laughs> There's no competition here. How could they pick one of those folks over me? That's a very dangerous place to be because then you'll forget some basics like your vision for the store. So I fired off a quick thank you note. Thank you for the great discussion, for the insights you shared. By the way, we didn't get a lot of opportunity to talk about my vision for the store. If you'd like to discuss that, reach out at any time. Here's my cell phone number. And I click send. I'm like quickly bullet pointing it out. They're going to call me. I'm in a panic. And they never called me. Got the job. Oh, here's a vision. Here's a vision. Well, it can't affect anything anyway. <laughs> Hire him. So you see the language here for area A that I did earlier. I'm not going to repeat that for you, but overcome these objections before they become the reason they harden into the reason they don't select you. I'm very excited. Close it on a high note. What's our next step? All things being equal, it's about that chemistry. So think about how you're going to build that chemistry. Think about how you're going to uh, create the engagement that, that really drives things forward. Um, has to be all about them. This is a dating process, how you can help them, how you can make their problem, what's attractive about their company, not about, oh, how this is right for me. Who cares how it's right about for you? <laughs> I, I care. I care, but nobody else cares. You still have to be real. You still have to be genuine. Um, let's get over and now talk about video interviewing. It's a staple today. We have to do it all the time now. Uh, in the past, you know, not so much, but now we have to become proficient at it, which means very first thing you have to learn is I don't need to look at the screen. What I need to fall in love with is the camera lens. That's the only thing that matters. I need to see the camera lens so that I'm looking the other individual in the eye. That's how you begin to make a connection. And I have to position things differently. And this is whatever platform we're on for our interview. It all applies there. Think about the fact that your interviews can be scheduled, unscheduled, in person, over video. All of that is about getting you to the finish line and having them see you as this perfect individual. Uh, we're going to pass the COVID-19 interviewing, which I should probably take this slide out now, even though it's still hanging around. Um, let's look at a few Zoom screens that I pulled off the internet. Um, chemistry and confidence win the race, right? So... Do we see it? Do we see it? Uh, you know what? I, I don't see it. I don't see the chemistry. don't see the confidence. I'm not even sure this person, person knows that it's a job interview. And they're certainly not interviewing for a sports equipment company. That doesn't really work. Chemistry and confidence win the day. Do we see it? Do we see it? You know, I, I don't see it here either. Um, I'm not sure I see anything with that bright background. All I see is them huddle down like a little weevil. Um, not going to work for us. Chemistry and confidence win the day. Do I see it? Do I see it? Well, I'm sure the person thinks they have it, but I don't I don't really see it. And I don't really need to see the beams on your ceiling, and I don't need to see up your nose, <laughs> which means we have to change the positioning of our equipment. That part is not brain surgery, so we have to think about that. Chemistry and confidence win the day. Do we, do we see it? Do we see it? You know what? I'll, I'll give them the confidence piece. I will give them the confidence piece right before I take it away because – I'm sorry if you need to wear a boom mic. Oh, I like to listen that way. I get it. I get it. But that 
just tells me that you're not confident. Also, picking an image like this for your background, yes, it's a nice image, but it's so distracting, it makes me look past you and doesn't bring the focus to you, which is the point that we're after here. So I suspect this person doesn't really have confidence. Chemistry and confidence win the day. Do we see it? Do we see it? You know what? I'm going to give them, even though it's a little bit of a stern look, I'm going to give them both of them, I think it's there. I like the framing. I like this square everything. Um, I'm not sure the square image that's up on the wall makes sense because it keeps upstaging the individual. And, I, you know, I keep going, well, what's that behind you? I want to see that. So don't allow yourself to be upstaged. Chemistry and confidence win the day, win the race. Do we see it? Do we see it? Um, you know, I, I do see the chemistry. I do see the confidence. But again, we've allowed this curved wall with imagery upstaging ourselves. And I keep trying to go, what's, what's in those pictures? What's in those pictures? That doesn't really work for us. Chemistry and confidence win the day. Do we see it? Do we see it? You know, I do see it. I, I feel it. It's a nice, simple setup. I like it. Uh, I'm not sure the Princess Leia earbud, <laughs> earbud uh, uh, earphones uh, really help you there. So those giant headphones have to go away. I, I, I don't care uh, what we're conveying there. It has to go away. Chemistry and confidence win the day. Do we, do we see it? Do we see it? Uh, I'll, give them, I'll give it to them on both of them. Uh, even these medium sized little headphones don't really like them. But one thing I can say that's, it's good besides the lighting is good here is the background image selection. Yeah. I know it's just a stock photo. The background image selection is right because it creates some depth. Oh, notice this nice depth behind me, even though I'm right up against a wall, <laughs> green screen. Um, and, and it doesn't draw focus away from the individual. It adds focus to the individual. Best one out of the group, chemistry and confidence win the day. We see it. We see it. Now, I, I do wish the angle was a little bit better. I do wish it was lit a little better on the one side, but the nice framing of the three bars on the left and a little bit of the image on the right, it's all fine, not distracting. I get it. Uh, all things being equal, this one is the winner, and all things are never equal. That's just part of it. A few other video interviewing secrets. I'm going to show you my setup right now to begin to think about how to solve some of your problems. First off, I always recommend standing up, not sitting down, standing up. This is my other half's pandemic setup from a couple of years back, maybe more than a couple of years back. Um, unlike myself, they are fine staring into the light all day long. So they're staring right out the window, incredibly well lit, looks really great. Uh, you need great light if you're going to look great. Sometimes you might need to add a light ring. Uh, those light rings have color adjusters on it if in case you're too yellow or too this or too blue or too red or whatever it might be. But likely also have to elevate the computer to get the camera up to eye level. This is not about you being comfortable. This is a video and it has to be right for video. If you'd like to do it right, you need to stand up to free up the diaphragm, to drop your vocal register, to create resonance that creates chemistry and connection and engagement. And you very likely need a decent mic. Here's the mic I'm speaking on right now, Blue Snowball, condenser mic. Yep, the mics built into the laptops these days are pretty darn good, but they don't beat a condenser mic. It's worth the difference. Yes, I'm standing in front of my own ironing board. So I have an ironing board. Actually, these are the same boxes I have, even though it's years later. My boxes are all uh, up because I'm a tall guy and I have to get the computer and the camera and everything up. I have three giant light boxes around me. Now, this was my original setup over in the bedroom. The ironing board was right next to the bed, left me about one square foot of space to stand in, which is about what I have right here, actually. You notice I can still move around all the time, and yet my feet don't really move, and I stay right in frame. Um, let's show you the flip side of, of that setup. We had a green screen on the wall there. Now I moved out into a front alcove area where I green screened the entire wall setup so I can even do a two-camera setup, <laughs> which is really great. And... Um, you have to think about the small things like where is John putting that coffee every time right on that stool? Where is he? If he needs to sit down his controller, where is he putting it? Uh, where are the tissues? Where's uh, eyeglass wipe if I need it? All of those things that you have to uh, notes, anything else ha has to have a place. Probably need bright lights. My eyes are hazel. They don't like bright lights, but somehow when the lights come on for our session, I'm fine for that hour. You have to, you know, as a public speaker, you have to step on stage all the time in blinding lights and so many of my competitor speakers if we want to say that way we're so like like oh the other speakers don't like the lights and i have to come in and fix them because they've all like turned them away from them it's like you need to be in the light you're the speaker <laughs> that's today's interview intervention 
Um, think about this phrasing here, intervention. Most of us need an intervention before our next interview because we just didn't prepare. We just didn't think it through. We just didn't go through all the steps that could make us some of the best of our presentations ever. You know, if we don't have a plan for our interview, if we don't have a plan for our job search, it's not likely to come out the way we'd like it to be. If our LinkedIn profile doesn't position and sell us like a three-dimensional sales brochure convincing them we're the best, not likely to turn out the way we'd like it to be, or we're not likely to be selected. Check out my building your career brand lecture. If your resume doesn't uh, give them the essence and value of your career with really out without reading, they need to be able to absorb it within seconds, not likely to have the outcome you'd like. So check out my other lectures. If you need help, I think you know where to find me over on selfrecruiter.com. Check out my services tab to see all the packages. And of course, if you need to speak to me, Send me a quick email, john at selfrecruiter.com, and we'll talk so you know which one is right for you. Thank you guys for joining in. It really does help if you can like, comment, share with your friends, everything else. That's the way to help. I really do appreciate it. Thank you guys for tuning in. Take care.